Amen. We are waiting for that glorious day. Amen. An awesome day to be in the house of the Lord. Can you pray with me as we prepare to receive God's word this morning? Father, I just want to give you the praise and glory and the honor for what has already transpired this morning. Thank you for this uh, assembled body of believers, this family who has come together uh, for a family meal, for an opportunity to exalt your son to your glory. And I pray that you would find this service pleasing. I pray now, Father, that you would uh, help us by opening our eyes and our ears to see uh, what your word has for us this morning. Uh, help us not just to be hearers, but doers, uh, receiving and applying and bearing fruit from your word so that we might live out the calling that you have given us, so that we might be uh, a people uh, that glorifies you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Aren't you glad summer's here? Amen. I mean, most people love summer. <laughs> oh, some are shaking their head no. Wow. You should, you should probably just leave. <laughs> I mean, really, especially here in the Northeast, right? We get used to these... These winters that are just brutal, these long, snowy, cold winters, and they seem like they'll never end, and then finally we get some sunshine and warm weather. You know, this time of year, the kids are out of school, and it's a favorite time of year for people to plan a trip somewhere, to get out and enjoy the world around us. Now, thankfully, we finally reached a point where we're back to doing those things again. You know, you see these commercials, hotels are back, and they make it like it's this amazing thing to stay at a hotel, right? But you get like this state or that state plugging their tourism or their vacation deals. And people just love it. They love summer and, and for the most part people love to travel during this time of year. I'd say that we appreciate it a lot more now uh, considering what happened last year. Just think about it. Last year at this time if you wanted to take a vacation, one of your suitcases was for masks, right? So <laughs> you had a suitcase of masks, multiple negative COVID tests. And you probably had to prepare yourself that some of the attractions you wanted to visit or see just weren't going to happen, right? Uh, you want to go see a movie? No, not going to happen. Want to go on a cruise? Sorry, can't. You know, go to Disney World? Gates are closed. The, the global effects of COVID certainly changed people's travel plans amongst so many other things. But, but people were used to those trips. I mean, it's summer. we got to go on vacation. And so they started getting antsy at times. Well, what was the response? What did you start to see? What was the trend? For many, it was the rise of the, the virtual vacation. And you say, well, people are already having virtual meetings, they're having virtual parties, learning in virtual classrooms. Why not take a virtual vacation, right? And so companies started offering all sorts of these tour options. You, you've always wanted to see the Louvre in France? Well, there you go, do it from your couch. You enjoy the outdoors? Are you a frequent park visitor? Well, why not try Yellowstone in Yosemite right from the comforts of your home? Maybe you're an animal lover, you, you frequented the zoo, well, now you can see the best zoos in the world, from the San Diego Zoo to the Georgia Aquarium, logging right into their live cameras. Maybe you always wanted to go to the Great Wall of China, but you just, you couldn't. Now you can, you don't even have to get out of your pajamas, right? Maybe you're very adventurous. Well, why not go to Mars, right? You could, you could do that virtually now. These are just a few of the options that, that were there, and believe it or not, you can still do all of those things virtually from your couch if you'd really like to. And these are neat, but there's one glaring, unavoidable problem. It's not the same as the real thing. It's one thing to look at Michelangelo's David on your computer screen, and quite another to see it through your own eyes. You only get a fraction of the beauty of Yellowstone from a TV set, right? It's a, it, it's a sterile... Uh, kind of worked over image, a well-produced snapshot. I'll tell you from experience, it's one thing to look at a grizzly bear on the screen and another to feel its power as it rushes up to the glass, right? You get the idea. Virtual vacations might provide a nice distraction. They might be informative and educational, even fun at times, but they're not the real thing. If anything, they stir in people an even greater desire to go and experience the real thing for themselves. They serve as markers pointing to the real deal. Because ultimately, there is no replacement for the real thing. You say, well, what's the point? In a far more meaningful and eternally significant way, this is the story of the letter to the Hebrews. There were many significant people written about before Jesus. There were many important rituals and ceremonies before Jesus. There were many treasured practices and traditions before Jesus. In fact, there was an entire God-given religion, namely Judaism, 
before Jesus. But hear me now, none of the people, practices, ceremonies, or even the entirety of Judaism was meant to take preeminence over Jesus. Instead, it all pointed to Jesus Christ, to the real deal, if you will. Everything else were just shadows and copies pointing to the substance. Now that he has come, died, and rose again, now that he is seated at the right hand of the Father, why would you go after the signs and symbols when you can have the real thing? Why take the virtual tour when God is offering you the true experience through his Son? That is what is on the mind of the writer of Hebrews. And that should be on our minds as well. As we begin this study of the book of Hebrews, we, we have to ask the question right off the bat. Does Jesus Christ have preeminence in your life? And, and I don't mean just intellectually. I mean in practice, does Jesus reign supreme in your life? Have you surrendered and submitted to his reign and rule in your life? Or are you still messing about with shadows and copies? Perhaps even profane and cheap substitutes. I want you to hear me. Make no mistake, Jesus Christ is supreme over all that lives and breathes. But have you submitted to that supremacy? Far too often we get tricked into thinking that, that faith in God is some sort of Santa Claus situation. Like, I, he's only real if I believe in him. And if I don't, then it doesn't apply to me. Rest assured, your belief or unbelief has absolutely zero effect on the reality of who Jesus Christ was, is, and always will be. Amen. It does, however, have everything to do with where and how you will spend eternity. So I want us to pay very close attention over the coming weeks and months and beyond as we work through this precious book. Today's just an introduction. And my goal is to instruct you in some of the background of the book, but more importantly, I wish to whet your appetite to the glorious reality of the supremacy of Jesus Christ. I know some of you here who have been with us are saying, whoa, wait a minute. I thought we were doing a whole summer on Joseph and the providence of God in his life. That was the plan. Plans change. <laughs> I started studying through this in preliminary work three and a half, four months ago, and, and as I did, and as I prayed and spoke with Pastor, I just began to have this overwhelming burden to share this book sooner or later. It is my earnest belief that the best thing for Calvary Baptist Church at this point is to go through Hebrews. And so that is what we are going to do. And we're going to, again, as it's an introduction, we'll touch down at various points in the book, but I really believe that the letter is summed up in the first three verses. And so if you would, turn your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 1. And to set the stage for us, I just want to read the first three verses. Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. After God spoke long ago in various portions and in various ways to our ancestors, through the prophets, in these last days he has spoken to us in a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he created the world. The Son is the radiance of his glory and the representation of his essence, and he sustains all things by his powerful word, so that when he had accomplished cleansing for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. Do you sense it? Do you sense the magnitude of the message of this book? It ought to give you goosebumps when you read verses like that. And so I want to start this morning by taking time to address some of the necessary background information. Specifically, I want to talk to you about the author, the approximate date, and the audience of Hebrews. Now, if this were just about any other New Testament book, this would be about a three-minute section. I would just share with you some generally agreed-upon details that help us better have a, an understanding of the context of the book. But Hebrews, however, is notoriously difficult when it comes to, to some of these details, to pinpointing them, each of these are hotly contested and quite challenging to come to concrete answers. But I want to see what we can do to arrive at some, some helpful conclusions. Perhaps the most hotly debated detail when we think about Hebrews is, who wrote it? Who wrote it, right? I'll say from the onset that all sorts of theories have been proposed 
throughout church history, but none have reached a majority consensus for very long. We'll look at just a few of the popular opinions, but I want to say right now that I'm going to tell you definitively who the author of Hebrews is. Okay? Stay tuned for that. So when it comes to the question of who wrote Hebrews, there's some popular theories. The first is the Apostle Paul. Paul was a very popular choice in the Eastern Church uh, almost right away. And then about the mid-4th century, became popular in the Western Church as well, all the way up to the Reformation. But as time passed and people really continued to dig into Paul's other letters and his style of writing, as knowledge of the Greek language uh, grew over time, support for Paul began to wane significantly. Because it's widely known that the, the style of Greek that the writer of Hebrews uses, as well as the vocabulary and rhetoric, it varies widely from Paul's other writings. Additionally, if you've read a letter from Paul, you know within the first couple of verses it's from Paul. And you know at the end, it's from Paul. And this letter lacks that traditional Pauline greeting. As a matter of fact, it just launches right into uh, the substance of the argument, as we just saw. I think all those are good reasons to exclude Paul. But the most convincing argument actually comes from within the letter itself. Look at chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. How will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was first communicated through the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Well, God confirmed their witness with signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Well, how does that disprove Paul as the author of Hebrews? Look again at what the text says about the gospel. It was first communicated through the Lord, then confirmed to us by those who heard him. Well, who are those who heard him? First and foremost, the apostles. Paul never once claims to have been instructed in the gospel by an apostle. As a matter of fact, he constantly defends his own apostleship. Paul is very proud of the fact that he had a personal meeting with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, and then later talks about the years he spent in Arabia being taught directly by the Holy Spirit. Whoever wrote Hebrews had received the gospel secondhand. They were second generation Christians, so to speak. And so I believe that that definitively excludes Paul as the writer of the book. Now, he might be the most popular choice throughout history, but there have been others put forward. Some say that because of the quality of the Greek, it might have been Luke that wrote it. Some go far as to say that this was a sermon or a series of homilies that Paul gave, and Luke recorded them in very polished Greek. We will see that this very much reads like a sermon, the book of Hebrews. There's no doubt about that. But as far as this argument goes, it's just a, a neat idea with really no support. Others, perhaps provocatively, have put forth Priscilla, along with maybe some help from her husband Aquila as the author of Hebrews. Chapter 11, the writer uses the singular masculine pronoun. Kind of hard for Priscilla to do, right? I think that excludes her. We've had others, Barnabas, Silas, Philip, the evangelist, Clement of Rome, he frequently quotes Hebrews, even Mary, the mother of Jesus. Again, fun theories. Virtually no real support. I think that the one who garners the most support was first brought forward by Martin Luther. That's Apollos. That has some merit. What we do know is that the author of Hebrews, excuse me, the writer of Hebrews, was a highly educated man. A man with tremendous understanding of the Old Testament and the ability to rightly interpret it. The writer also had a passion to see lost people come to Christ and a desire for those who had come to stay firmly committed and grow in their relationship with him. Apollos certainly checks all of those boxes, what we know about him from Acts, but it doesn't prove anything about him being the writer. The early church father, Origen, I think put it the best when he said, but who wrote the epistle in truth? Only God knows. I agree with you. Who wrote Hebrews? I don't have a clue. It's true, at this point, only God knows. And you say, wait a minute. Like, four minutes ago, you made this very bold claim. I did. I, I told you that I would definitively tell you who the author was. Because I have no idea who put pen to paper as a human writer. But I have no doubt that the author of Hebrews is the Holy Spirit. 
All scripture is inspired. It is God breathed, God authored. You need to understand that as you read scripture. There might be human writers, but it is all authored by God. And I intentionally took a, a little bit of time to tease this out because it's important for us to remember this truth. Here, here's the reality. You can take almost any book of the Bible, even ones that are nearly universally agreed upon with a specific author that names themselves. And you can find dozens of people that will tell you all the reasons that that person didn't write that book. Sometimes we get so caught up in chasing all these theories and speculations that we miss the simple but exceedingly precious truth that it does not matter one bit who the human author was because the real author is God himself. It's nice, certainly, to get more context and background, right? Second Timothy takes a a more somber tone when we understand that Paul's near the end of his life. Luke and Acts take on a more personal note when we see it's a, a two-part letter from one friend to another. These are nice, but they're not necessary to draw out what we're supposed to know. The Holy Spirit is the author of Scripture, period. And if you are, if you are a Christian and you're here this morning, then the one who has authored Scripture has also sealed you indwells you. You are in reality a temple for him. What an encouragement as we read and study and immerse ourselves in the very words of God. And so we have clearly the author. Now let's talk the approximate date and the intended audience. So again, we can't be perfectly certain because most New Testament letters are very hard to date, but I believe that it was somewhere in the mid-60s A.D., Let's think about it for a minute. Enough time has to have passed from the ascension that we have the apostles taking the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ out and you now have an established church, right? And you have this second generation, so to speak, Christian writing to this established church of mainly converted Jews. They've been enough time to be an established church and also enough time to have faced tremendous persecution, including imprisonments. So a, a mid-60s date would coincide with the rise of persecution from Rome, specifically from Nero. Nero took rule in AD 54. Fast forward 10 years to AD 64, and what happens? Rome burns. Most people believe that Nero himself set that fire. But when the backlash came, he had to find someone to blame. These kooky Christians, convenient people to pin it on. And so persecution was ramped up even more. Hebrews frequently refers to their persecution, but one of the clearest statements of it is in chapter 10, verses 32 through 34. Remember the former days when you endured a harsh conflict of suffering after you were enlightened. At times you were publicly exposed to abuse and afflictions. At other times you came to share with others who were treated in that way. For in fact, you shared the sufferings of those in prison and accepted the confiscation of your belongings with joy, because you knew that you certainly had a better and lasting possession. So they've been around long enough to be an established church who have faced sufferings, persecutions, afflictions, even imprisonments. But we also know that the letter had to have been written before the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. The writer of Hebrews speaks about the current, or the sacrificial system and the temple in terms that indicate it's still going on in Jerusalem at the time this letter was written. So, after the ascension, long enough for an established church, but before the destruction of the temple in AD 70, I believe, again, that puts us firmly in a date of the mid-60s AD. That's important, because these people were just on the cusp of seeing the temple that they held so dear come to destruction. And the writer of Hebrews prepares them for that, why that's okay. And we'll see that as we get into the book later. Finally, let's talk the audience. Who was it written to? Normally we talk about where they were located, right? We don't have an exact location. Again, there's speculation, and most of it comes from the very end of the book. Greetings to all your leaders and the saints. Those from Italy send you greetings. Those from Italy. Okay, this could cut one of two ways. Either these are, are folks who were originally from Italy, who have been expelled and in AD 49, when Claudius kicked out all the Jews, maybe, that's where Priscilla and Aquila came from, right? It could mean that group, or it could be referring to people who still live in Italy. And you go, which is it? I don't know. Again, 
it's not ultimately <coughs> important to the context of Hebrews. Here's what is important. Here's what we know for sure. It is an overwhelmingly, if not exclusively, Jewish audience. You, you have zero references throughout the letter of Gentiles being in their midst. Compare that to almost every other New Testament epistle, and there are these calls to cultural unity, to oneness, to togetherness. How do we blend these two people groups that used to be enemies and now have been reconciled? <clears throat> it's possible that there were some Gentiles, but if they were, they were likely proselytes to the Jewish religion before converting to Christianity. Right? The, the writer assumes that his audience has extensive <coughs> knowledge of the Old Testament, including the rites and rituals of the Levitical priesthood. Some have said, if you want to understand Hebrews, you have to first understand Leviticus. <coughs> if you don't understand Leviticus, don't worry. By the time we're done Hebrews, you will. Okay? They're, they're very interconnected. And so a Gentile, freshly converted to Christianity, would not have this understanding. So if it is Gentiles, they almost certainly have been converted to Judaism, before converting to Christianity. So, we know it's almost an entirely Jewish audience, even as the title suggests, the letter to the Hebrews. But within this Jewish audience, there are three subgroups that are the key to rightly interpreting the book of Hebrews. Hebrews has tormented some people. Passages like chapter 2, chapter 6, chapter 10, that have caused all this confusion about, can I lose my salvation? Can I not? What's, what's happening with all this, right? Knowing these groups and who, is, who are being spoken to when, that's the key to interpreting, right? Who is the Holy Spirit speaking to at any given time? And so, what are they? First, we have the genuinely converted Christians. The majority of the book is written to this group. These are those Jews and potential proselytes who have placed their faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, and they've moved on from Judaism, right? They're, they've drawn near to God through Christ, and they've left behind their old religious system. At least they're trying to do that. We'll talk about that a little more later. The second group, however, are those who have intellectually assented to the gospel. But they've not surrendered their lives in truth to the reign and rule of Jesus. They believe that he is who the apostles say he is. But they have not personally received him as their savior and lord. In fact, even in the midst of intellectual confession, they practically reject him. Their intellectual belief is, yeah, Jesus is the Messiah, but their controlling belief is that they reject him as their Savior. And so you'll see at various points in the book, the Holy Spirit makes a direct appeal to this group. Again, some of these places have been the cause of great confusion, but when we understand who's being addressed, it makes things much clearer. Look again just briefly at chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 with me. Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we've heard so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken through angels proved to be so firm that every violation or disobedience received its just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was first communicated through the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. While God confirmed their witnesses with signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Again, we're going to unpack these verses in detail when we come to them, but, but for now, just see the appeal from the Spirit to these people on the fence to commit all the way. Pay closer attention. Don't neglect so great a confirmation or a salvation. It's been confirmed by the apostles, and God himself has confirmed it with signs and wonders and miracles. Essentially, the Holy Spirit saying, what more proof do you need? Make a decision. We see the same group addressed in chapter 6 and chapter 10, as I said. The third and final group are those who reject the gospel altogether. They come to the assembly, they, they hear, they listen to what's taught, but they remain unconvinced of the gospel on any level. Much of chapter 9 is, is addressed to this particular group. So we think about this and we say, well, these three groups really aren't that surprising at all. I mean, it makes perfect sense, does it not? Are these not the same three groups of people that we see in every church, every Sunday morning, around the world? This might surprise you. These three groups are here this morning. Make no mistake. Some of you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and your confession is true, and it is genuine. Sure, you have need of more sanctification, 
You, you need to be more confirmed to the image of Christ, but, but you are eternally secure in the hands of the Father as a dearly loved child. You understand that, that Christ did everything you could not do, and you trust in His righteousness and not your own. Praise God for that. But some of you are here this morning, and you have merely intellectually assented to the gospel. You, you, you grasp the concepts of it. You go, yeah, that's probably true. It's probably accurate. But in reality, you continue to reject Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You believe that he lived, died, maybe even rose again, but you remain uncommitted to him. There's no fruit of repentance, no fruit of salvation. If that's you this morning, I got news for you. You still want to be Lord of your own life. You want to be double minded. You want to try to serve two masters. You, you say you love God, but in truth, you reject his rule, you reject his son. If that's you this morning, I, I would implore you, even as the Holy Spirit does, get off the fence. Totally surrender to Jesus Christ today. Today is the day of salvation. I'm going to ask you, like the Holy Spirit does, what more information do you need? Move beyond the merely intellectual and receive the gift of salvation by grace through genuine faith in Jesus Christ and His work on your behalf. You heard Sam say it in his testimony. Just praying a prayer doesn't save you. Plenty of people have intellectually prayed that prayer. And it had zero impact on their lives. No repentance. No turning from sin into God, sin into God through Christ. If you don't see fruit of salvation in your life, but you claim to be, believe the gospel, get off the fence. Turn to him today. Finally, some of you are here this morning and you're rejecting Jesus Christ on every level. Maybe you're here because you were curious. Maybe you, you feel like you were forced to come, like you have to be here. Maybe you know a friend compelled you to come, a family member, a loved one. But inside, you want nothing to do with this. To you, I would make the same plea. Consider today the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done. How he took the sin that you could never pay for in this life, and he took it upon himself. How he suffered, bled, and died for what you did in your stead, so that you might have eternal life if you would only receive him by faith. Can I tell you something? The only unforgivable sin is to reject Jesus Christ permanently. Some of you might be here and say, I've sinned too much. I've gone too far. Nonsense. The only unforgivable sin is the permanent rejection of Jesus Christ. So I urge you, stop rejecting and receive him. He won't turn you away. It is not too late until it is too late. You don't know what that day is, and neither do I. So don't delay. Today is the day of salvation. We have our important background information in place. We, we know the author is the Holy Spirit. We, we think the, the dating is the mid-60s, and we have our, our audience, this mixed group of genuine Christians intellectually assenting but not yet converted, and those who reject the gospel. But now, let's solidify in our hearts and minds the main argument of the book of Hebrews. The main argument. There's a lot of debate on the first couple points we just went over. There's virtually no debate on this. It's in the title of your bulletins. It's on the sign. You've heard it all morning, right? It is the supremacy of Jesus Christ that is overwhelmingly the main argument of the book of Hebrews. Jesus Christ is better than all the shadows and copies that preceded him. He alone is superior. He alone is preeminent. I said earlier that Hebrews reads very much like a sermon, and many people do believe that, in fact, it is. It, it could be one cohesive sermon that was recorded and then distributed to this this church of Jewish believers. And I think it fits as you read here. I encourage you this week. Take time to read all 13 chapters. It takes about 55 minutes to do so. Which is great support that the early church preached hour-long sermons. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Marty. <laughs> Just seeing if you're still awake or not. The theme is unavoidable. 
supremacy of Jesus Christ who runs all throughout. And again, we're not going to take time to pick these apart, but, but I want to give you this morning just 11 ways that Hebrews points to the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to run through them fairly quickly. I want you to see how the Holy Spirit presents Jesus as being superior to everything and everyone who came before him. So first, we see right away in the first three verses we read this morning, Jesus is the superior revelation of God. Right? At one time, God used prophets, dreams, visions, etc. But, but he has most clearly spoken to us through his Son. Jesus Christ is the perfect revelation of God. Why? Because he is God in the flesh. The Holy Spirit wants us to see that Jesus is superior to the angels. Angels are amazing beings. Incredible. They're created beings. They're created to, to serve in God's presence and to minister to the elect, it says. As the eternal, victorious Son of God, Jesus is far superior to any angel. He's superior to Moses. Now, Hebrews tells us that Moses was faithful in his ministry as a servant. Jesus was faithful as God's Son. As a son. Jesus is superior to Joshua. Joshua's a remarkable man. There's no doubt. Joshua led the Israelites into the promised land, had great victory, and gave them a partial and temporary rest. Jesus Christ leads his people into a perfect and eternal rest. Jesus is a superior priest to Aaron and the Levites. Aaron and his descendants were appointed to the priesthood for one reason. God appointed them to be so, and from then on it was their bloodline. That was the only qualification to be a priest. What was your bloodline? What was your, your lineage? There were flawed, sinful, mortal men who served for a brief period of time and then were replaced. Their work was never complete, as sin prevented it from being so. Jesus Christ is the perfect, holy, sinless, compassionate high priest, chosen not because of his bloodline, but because of who he is and what would, he would accomplish. His priesthood is superior in every way. There are chapters dedicated to this in the Hebrews. As part of that superior priesthood, Jesus offered a superior sacrifice, namely himself. Day after day, month after month, year after year, the priest would have to offer bulls and goats and lambs and blood everywhere, all of the time. It was a terribly messy affair. It could never take away sin. The blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin, only temporarily cover it. Jesus Christ offered himself once and for all. His blood totally and completely cleansing those who would draw near to God through faith in him. Jesus mediates a superior covenant. The new covenant is superior to the old in every way. The old served a purpose, yes, but it was flawed and incomplete. The new, as we will see in Hebrews, is perfect and totally complete. Jesus ministers in a superior sanctuary. The priests of old ministered in a tabernacle and then a temple made of human hands, shadows, and copies of the heavenly sanctuary. Jesus Christ ministers in that heavenly sanctuary, always making intercession for us. Jesus offers us superior access to God. I talked about this last week very briefly. Don't take for granted the access you have to God. For centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries, access was severely limited. If you weren't a priest, you could go to the outer court. If you were a priest, you could go to the holy place. If you were the high priest, one day a year, for a very select period of time, you could go to the holy of holies. And it was a terrifying and awesome experience. That, that I'm sure in reality they couldn't wait till it was done, because it meant that they lived through it. Right? It was a terrifying thing. There was no personal nearness to God because of the enduring presence of sin. But because of the superior work of our sympathetic high priest, we have constant access to God. In fact, Hebrews tells us we can come boldly to the throne of grace to receive help, to receive help in our time of need. Jesus offers a superior example of faithfulness. Chapter 11, right? All of faith. Many, many faithful men and women who did amazing things before Jesus. But none came close to his perfect example. As the founder and perfecter of our faith, the one who endured the cross and despised the shame, now seated, hear that, that'll become important, seated at the right hand of the Father, the priests never got to sit down. 
They never got to sit. Their work was ongoing. Jesus did his work, and he's seated. Perfect example of faithfulness. Finally, Jesus provides a superior meeting place. Israel first met with God at, at Mount Sinai. It was a, a horrifying experience that left them begging for a buffer between them. The, the ground shook. Fire and smoke surrounded them. We don't meet God at Mount Sinai. We'll meet with God at Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem. One day we will dwell with the Lord in the new Jerusalem. We will be his people and he will be our God. We will see his face and his name will be on our foreheads. This was just the, the briefest of summaries of what this book has to offer as it heralds the supremacy of Jesus Christ. My friends, nothing compares to the real deal of Jesus Christ. Nothing compares to him and his completed work. Because of this reality, the Holy Spirit wants to warn and encourage his audience. And so I want to end today by briefly, briefly looking at the additional exhortations of Hebrews. The genuine Christians... They were committed to the Lord. They had surrendered to him. But a danger had crept in. They were in danger of sliding back into some of the legalistic tendencies of Judaism. They were tempted to start trying to add to the work of Jesus Christ. Frankly, they were also worn out from facing persecution and suffering for so long. They were not running the race as they, they should be. And they're starting to veer off course. The intellectually assenting members of the congregation were in danger of growing so dull that they would ultimately reject Jesus forever. Their hearts were starting to, to be additionally hardened. They were unwilling to go all the way and surrender to Jesus. And of course, those who had rejected Jesus in his glorious gospel had to repent before it was too late. They needed to see Jesus for who he was and what he had done and turn from their sin and to God through faith. And so interspersed with with the, the writer's continual reinforcing of the supremacy of Christ, and based upon the reality of that supremacy, the Holy Spirit appeals at times to each of these groups and addresses their specific needs. There are warnings, don't neglect salvation. Make a genuine commitment to Christ. Calls for repentance, calls for surrender. He encourages the believers, remember where you came from. Return to the way you lived when you first came to faith. He calls them to draw near to God through Christ, to come boldly to him, to endure persecutions, to remember that Jesus had already done all the work necessary. They could add nothing to it, and they needed to rest in him, rest authentically through faith. And they needed to encourage one another to continue on and look forward to their better and abiding inheritance. As we walk through Hebrews, we will find Warnings, encouragements, and exhortations that the Holy Spirit gave are just as necessary for us today. Consider with me just, just a couple of these. Hebrews 3. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has an evil, unbelieving heart that forsakes the living God. But exhort one another each day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by sin's deception. Are we not all in danger of being hardened by sin at one time or another? Should, should we not actively encourage each other to remain faithful to the living God? To repent often? Is that not necessary to be a healthy body of believers? Or consider perhaps a more well-known one in Hebrews 10, 23 to 25. Let us hold unwaveringly to the hope that we confess. For the one who made the promise is trustworthy. Let us take thought of how to spur one another on to love and good works, not abandoning our own meetings, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and even more, because you see the day drawing near. Don't you need encouragement to keep on keeping on sometimes? Shouldn't we be encouraging each other to love and to good works, to, to faithfully and regularly gathering together for mutual edification? Don't we need that? Hebrews is full of these wonderful exhortations that are both challenging and encouraging. And we will encounter them through the weeks and months. But hear me, they, they all flow from the basic but vital truth that Jesus Christ is superior to all that is, was, and ever will be. What a wonderful truth. I asked you at the very beginning, does Jesus Christ have preeminence in your life? I want you to remember, your belief or unbelief 
has no bearing on the ultimate reality that he is the supreme authority. Nothing will change that. But again, it has everything to do with, with how you will live in this life and the next. He alone is the way, the truth, and the life. No one draws near to the Father but through him and by him. He did all the work. The perfect high priest who was totally and completely successful in what he set out to do. And again, now he is seated at the right hand of God. Superior in every regard. That, my friends, is what Hebrews is all about. So I'm looking forward to taking this journey with you as we see that around every corner. So that it flows through every fiber of your being. So that you are firmly and utterly convinced that it does not get better than the real deal of Jesus Christ. So based on God's word, what are your next steps? Submit to Christ's supremacy. Again, if you're here and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, maybe you've intellectually assented, maybe you go, I, I get the gospel, but there's been no fruit, surrender to him. Get off the fence and submit. Can I tell you that this applies just as much to the believer? I, I, I wonder, Christian, what idol are you holding on to and placing above Jesus Christ this morning? What pet sin has such a grip on you that you can't honestly say Jesus Christ is preeminent in my life? Because I keep going back to this other thing. Repent of it. Remove it. Jesus didn't say coddle your pet sins. He said cut it off. Rip it out. Get rid of it. Declare Christ's supremacy. The Holy Spirit makes no bones about declaring the truth of the supremacy of Christ, and we should not either. We need to fearlessly declare it, no matter what reaction that declaration is met with. I want you to consider, just for a moment, what you saw at the beginning of the service. Is that not what these young people were saying through their act of baptism? Jesus Christ is preeminent in my life, and I want everyone to know. Praise God for that, but it doesn't stop at the baptismal tank, and it doesn't stop on Sunday. It's every other day of the week as you're out and about. Does your life declare the supremacy of Jesus Christ in it? Finally, hold fast to that supremacy. This vapor of a life sometimes doesn't feel much like a vapor, right? Sometimes it feels so long and so difficult that we might be tempted to, to drift away, to, to turn to things that promise satisfaction, that promise pleasure, but only offer harm. We must continually be reminded that Jesus is the real deal, and nothing is better than him. Friends, don't go back to virtual vacations when you can have the authentic experience. Hold fast to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this wonderful book that we call the Bible, and within it, these letters and these uh, historical accounts and poetic accounts and prophetic accounts, and Lord, just the, the perfection of your word. I thank you for this book of Hebrews, and well, there are so many things we would love to know more about, uh, you have sovereignly chosen that we don't. And so we trust that what we do know is what we need to know to gain the most from it. And we certainly can see from this book, Father, that your Son is superior to all that is, was, and will be. That Jesus Christ has the preeminence. And I pray that that would be true for each individual here this morning. Whether we've known you for, for one day or 70 years, we would not be drifting, that we would not be catering to idols in our life, but we would be repenting and turning to you in faith. I, I do pray, Father, earnestly for that one that maybe has been deceived into thinking that they know you. Because intellectually they know about you, but they don't really know you. That you would break through that hard heartedness this morning and, and, and you would bring them to salvation. Or that one that continues to just flat out reject you that they would be humbled by who you are and what you have done for them, and they would repent and turn in faith from their sin to you through your Son. What a generous, merciful, gracious, awesome God you are. We thank you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.